Blue's that I searched for, talked with, recorded, listened to in the 1950s. I did have singers that meant something deeply personal to me, their songs, their voices, and for both Annie and myself, Sleepy John Estes was one of those figures who was always close to us. And it was very difficult in the 50s because none of these artists was performing. None of them had any life outside the labels of the phonograph records that we had. And so I would ask again and again, have you met John Estes? Do you know where John Estes is? Nobody did. There was no way I could have known at the time that Estes was simply in Brownsville. He had done a Brownsville blues, uh, you know, and he gives his address on the record. Had I followed up the way other people did to follow Avalon, Mississippi and find Mississippi John Hurt, I, I would have come, if I'd taken that right-hand road, I would have found Estes. But he was found just while we were already just in the last weeks of leaving to make the film, he was found by a Freedom Rider, one of those kids in the buses where they were going south and battling against the National Guard, battling with troops. They were being jailed. They were, being, they were going to see that blacks had a right to vote. And one of them was in Brownsville, and he did go, and he found Sleepy John. And immediately the word spread. So Annie and I, of course, immediately decided. We'd never heard him, we had no idea if he could perform, but we had to find Sleepy John. So we did call ahead to a neighbor, uh, Philip Mu, who we understood could bring John to us. And he we understood from Philip Mu that where John lived, he had no electricity. Philip did, across the road. So Philip arranged for John to be there waiting for us when we drove up. And here was this man we had revered, we had admired, we had loved. And to see him in abject poverty, blind, sitting motionless, waiting for us to tell him something about who we were, what we were going to do. It was one of the most searing moments of my life. And for Annie to look at John, his eyes were running with pus because of the damage, and he was just sitting there, quite helpless, waiting for us to do something. So, uh, and you can see this in the film, I simply wanted people to seeing the film to share that moment, to understand what it was, to see this man, to see the poverty, and yet to see him struggle out from this, to pick up an old guitar, using a pencil for a capo, to put it on that fingerboard and to play for us. His fingers slowly getting a little more movement, slowly getting a little more, tapping his foot. But I felt it was important, as I've been saying all through the film, that the blues comes out of a place, it comes out of a society. So also we went up across the road and we filmed John's house. That is that shack with the flower hanging down the door. And there were the children looking at us, afraid of us, as here are these white people, afraid to say anything, just watching us, watching us, not even questioning us or protesting against our intrusion into their home. And then we recorded John in the dust outside and his feet tapping on the dust. And I felt I wanted to show that he was still close to the earth, that he was still feeling the rhythm, that it was a rhythm that was in Sleepy John Estes. And at the end, I could hear again that voice, that crying voice that had made him the artist that he was. And for me, this was, in a way, a culmination for everything we try to do in the film. And then there was nothing more to say. The film ended there. <laughs>